Okay. So uh, to do with cardiophysiology, um, firstly, we'll, I'll acknowledge um, how I've kind of made these slides. Um, so PSP has helped a lot, um, thanks to last year's lecture Denali as well, um, Chris Wright lecture, and as well as CV physio physiology, which has been really, really helpful. Um, so it's a good resource if you want to check that out. Um, in terms of yield from last year, so this is from our exam two at the end of the year. So physiology took up a fair chunk, nearly equal to anatomy. Um, so it's fairly high yield. So it's good to study. Um, and there are only a few key concepts that should be, uh, that you really need to get a key grasp on. So what are we covering? Um, we're gonna cover all the topics mostly. So circulation lymphatics, a bit of physics, um, some things to do with electrical conduction and the cardiac cycle. Um, and we'll also be focusing on exam questions for the main part. Um, so we've got some ACGs and some cardiac access because I know that can be pretty confusing sometimes. So if we start off now, um, to do with pressure, flow and resistance, the main thing um, that I would like you guys to know um, is that pressure causes flow. Um, and that means that flow will occur or fluid will move from an area of high pressure to low pressure. Um, and this will be really important for our valves as well as um, what, what valves open and sounds that come from the heart um, and just overall blood flow throughout the body. And the second point that's really important is knowing that resistance um, is proportional to one over radius uh, to the power of four. So that means a small increase in radius will have a massive change in resistance. Um, and same goes if you decrease the radius. Um, they really do like to test this topic. Uh, in terms of compliance, I think it's best shown in this diagram here. So in compliance, we're gonna be comparing um, the pressure versus how easy it is to increase the volume of that space. So with arteries, um, arteries are less compliant because as you increase the pressure, the volume or the lumen size is not gonna increase that much. Whereas if we compare that to a vein, they are highly compliant because a higher pressure will cause the relative volume of the vein to expand a lot more. So you can kind of picture a vein as a balloon that is really, really easy to blow up whereas an artery is a lot tougher to expand. Um, yeah. Uh, in terms of circulation, the main important things to take is, or the main important one point to take is the fact that venous return is always equal to cardiac output. Um, and this is always going to be true. If it were not to be equal, this would result in blood kind of backing up in some areas of the body. Um, and your heart wouldn't be able to function properly. Um, so venous return will always, always, always equal cardiac output. And we'll talk a bit about this later, um, but this is essentially due to Frank styling uh, laws. Um, in terms of our different, sorry, uh, in terms of our different parts of our circulation, uh, as we go exiting the heart um, towards our capillary beds and coming back to the heart, we have different types of circulation. So we have arter arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, and veins. Um, and each of them have a separate function. So arteries, particularly the ones that are first line from the heart. So we're thinking like the descending aorta, um, the arch of the aorta, things like that. Um, these have really strong muscular walls because it's first in line from the heart. So therefore it'll be exposed to a high blood pressure. Arterioles, the main function of these is to modulate blood flow. So you might find these um, in the arteries that might supply the gut um, to change how much, blood, how much blood is supplied there. Uh, capillaries are your small little networks that allow for nutrient exchange. Venules will collect the blood from the capillaries and veins. Um, the main distinctive point is that they have thin walls, um, which gives rise to our high compliance um, and these will return blood to the heart through the superior vena cava or the inferior vena cava. Um, in terms of constriction in arterioles and veins, this is a particularly important point to get. Um, and it can be a bit confusing, um, particularly in some questions when they talk about constriction and what would happen. So the main point to take here is that constriction in arterioles will reduce the flow. So if we constrict our arterioles, 
going to our stomach, for example, there's going to be less flow of blood to our stomach. Um, and this is what we get when we constrict our arterioles. However, if we constrict our veins, there's going to be increased flow. And when I say increased flow, I mean increased flow back to the heart. Um, yeah, so that is an important distinction to make. In terms of electrical conduction, um, it's fairly complicated, I think. We have a lot of ion movement um, between two types of cells. So we have two types, pacemakers, uh, which constantly and spontaneously um, trigger an, an action potential, whereas ventricular action potentials um, don't occur spontaneously, um, and they're characterized by these green action potentials. Um, I believe Ramya would have talked about this in her lecture a couple of days ago, um, so we won't be going through this one today. In terms of autonomics, um, Andrew just spoke about it a tiny bit. Um, but in terms of our autonomics, um, the heart rate will always be dependent on whichever pacemaker cell is the fastest. Um, and this should normally be your sinoatrial node in your right atrium. Um, and during classes that I think they explain it as kind of a train, um, how fast a train goes will always be dependent on which carriage is going the fastest. And the same applies for the heart. Now these three rates, the SA node, AV node, and Purkinje fibers, all of them will be spontaneously firing. However, the SA node will be at the greatest rate. So this is roughly between 60 and 100 BPM. Your AV node, um, it'll still be going off at 50 to 60 BPM. It's just we don't see this because the SA node is going faster than that. And Purkinje, 15 to 40. Um, occasionally, you'll see a bit of variation within these rates. Um, however, the general principle is that SA node is fastest, AV second fastest, Purkinje slowest. Um, in terms of what controls our heart rate, we have both sympathetic and parasympathetic control. Um, so sympathetic control is all to do with fight and flight. And as part of this response, we want to maximize the amount of blood that is delivered to our muscles um, and other important structures, such as your brain. So for this, um, when we activate our sympathetic nervous system, this will increase the rate, so the number of times firing per minute, um, and this will be through the AV node. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, it will increase the rate at the SA node. It'll um, and it will increase the speed of conduction through the AV node. So there's less of a delay, and it will it will also cause stronger ventricular contraction, so that more blood is pumped out with every systolic contraction. In terms of parasympathetic innovation, there's a constant vagal tone. Uh, coming from your vagus nerve, which you will learn to be as cranial nerve 10 later on. And this will result in a rate that, um, that is slower than the intrinsic rate of the SA node. So if we look back here, the SA node um, goes from 60 to 100. But what happens is that through the vagus nerve, there's a vagal tone, which constantly keeps it down. Um, and we'll be going through this in a question to do with a heart transplant and to see what happens. Um, so that's an important point to know, um, or just to keep in the back of your mind until we get to that question. Um, and just adding on, uh, in addition to our thoracic sympathetic nervous system, uh, we also have catecholamines, which are things such as adrenaline and noradrenaline, um, and this will do the same thing. Um, just a question from someone. Um, is the rate at which the heart fires different to heart rate, uh, since heart rate is dependent on ventricular contraction rate? Yeah, so for the most, yeah, so heart, the rate at which a heart fires will be the same as the heart rate. Um, because if we consider this scenario here where we have a perfectly normal functioning heart, um, that will be at approximately 60 to 100 beats per minute, um, probably on the lower side, hopefully. Um, and since this is the fastest throughout the entire heart, this will also dictate the rate at which the ventricles fire. Um, if it's misaligned, um, that will be a form of, that's a pathology that we'll be able to see in an ECG. Um, for the most part, in a normal individual, um, the rate at which the SA node fires should be the same as the ventricular contraction rate. 
Um, hopefully that helped. Um, in terms of the spread of excitation throughout the heart, uh, we start off in the SA node, which is in the right atrium. Um, and this spreads throughout the, both the right and left atria. Uh, and then we go through the AV node where it's slowed down um, through the bundle of Hiss, which uh, exists kind of between uh, the two ventricles. And this will split off into the right and left bundle branches. Um, the only difference between these two is just one goes to the right ventricle, the other one goes to the left. Um, and then around the ventricles through the Purkinje fibers, um, and this will cause contraction, um, notably from the apex first and then through to the walls. Um, just a small point here, uh, in terms of how that signal is passed out through the heart, um, this is occurring through muscle cells um, and that's allowed for by gap junctions um, or our interclated discs. Um, so it's not nerve fibers, but it's actually gap junctions, which allow the transfer of ions between adjacent cells that allow for this contraction. Um, and it's really important that we get really coordinated contraction um, so that our entire atria can contract at the same time and our ventricles can contract at the same time um, to allow for proper blood flow. Um, yeah, so as I said here, atrioventricular node will slow down conduction. Um, and this is to allow for blood to enter the ventricles. Um, this is not too much of an important point um, to do with how we contract our muscles. I guess the key point that you should know is that you need calcium from outside the cell, um, but you also need calcium from inside the cell. And this intracellular calcium is crucial for heart contractions. Um, and we talk about calcium channels, um, and this is why we use calcium channel blockers. Uh, in terms of our um, in terms of our cardiac cycle, uh, systole is contraction, diastole is relaxation. Uh, once again, blood will always go from high pressure to low pressure. And valves will help to stop the black valves will help to stop the backflow of blood. Um, and that's would and this would depend on the pressure on both sides of the valve. Um, our heart sounds come from the closing of valves. So I like to think of it as slamming the door closed. Um, and then lastly, when we come to our ECG later, um, these are important things to align together. Um, so our P wave is atrial depolarization or atrial contraction. QRS is ventricular depolarization or contraction. And T wave is ventricular repolarization, which is relaxation. Um, we have different phases. Um, I think the main thing to take note of here is looking at what valves are open, what valves are closed, um, looking at which part of our ECG lines up with which phase. Um, and yeah, otherwise I will leave this for you guys to read in your own time. Um, but yeah, we can see this Wiggers diagram here. So we can see the um, pressure changes. And I guess the main thing to show here is where our first and second heart sound come from. So our first heart sound down here occurs in systole, and this occurs when the mitral valve closes. Um, so that's uh, that mitral valve is between your left atrium and your left ventricle. Um, whereas in diastole, that's where you get your second heart sound. Um, and this is where your aortic valve closes between your left ventricle and your aorta. Um, so it's always the closing of the valves that causes our heart sounds. Um, once again, cardiac output is always going to be equal to venous return. Um, but these are two equations that you should know fairly easily and be able to manipulate them. Um, so cardiac output is stroke volume. Um, so liters pumped out of the heart per beat multiplied by how many beats you get per minute. And stroke volume is how much blood is pumped out of the heart at every systole. Um, things that are affecting cardiac output. Um, essentially, if we increase venous return, we will increase cardiac output. Um, so always remembering that relationship. Um, and this is because if we fill the heart up more, that's going to cause the heart muscles to be stretched further. Um, and therefore, if it's stretched further, it'll be able to contract more strongly. Um, and therefore, we'll increase our cardiac output. 
And this is primarily determined by the amount of calcium, um, because if we have more calcium, this will cause our heart to um, contract more vigorously, um, therefore increase our cardiac output. And heart rate, um, if we increase our heart rate, then we'll also get an increased cardiac output. And that's going back to our slide about the autonomic innovation to the SA node. Uh, in terms of venous return, we have more factors that can affect this, and this will ultimately also affect our cardiac output. Uh, the main thing to take here is that if we have um, a greater pressure in the right atrium, uh, that means we might have a lower venous return uh, because we have to remember that blood will always flow from a high pressure area to a low pressure area. So therefore, if we have a greater pressure in the right atrium where it's trying to go, we're going to have less blood flow into that area. Um, that's the main thing to take from here. Uh, in terms of arteries and lymphatics, uh, during systole, our arteries, um, not all of the blood will be traveling through them. So two thirds of it will stretch the walls and one third will flow through it. And then during diastole, that two thirds from earlier on will then flow through it. Um, so this will allow for constant blood flow despite our heart only contracting uh, like 70 odd times a minute or so. Uh, learn these equations. Um, I got confused last year because I just couldn't do maths. Um, these two equations here, one third of systolic plus two thirds of diastolic, that's exactly the same as diastolic plus one third of pulse pressure. Um, it's still good to know both because some numbers that they give you on the exam will be more friendly um, to one of these equations. Um, also dividing by three is just not fun. So just, I think it's, I think it's useful to know both of them. Um, and you can also just see the link if you like substitute systolic minus diastolic here and then just expand it out. Um, but you can do that in your own time if you want to check. Um, so we talked about arterioles before. So they help to change the amount of blood flow that, occur that occurs and that's through constricting the smooth muscle layer. Um, so this will reduce the radius and therefore reduce um, the flow. Uh, we have various ways to control the arterioles, uh, primarily active and reactive hyperemia. Active hyperemia is kind of constant changing. So if there's increased metabolism, we'll have more blood flow. However, if we occlude a vessel, we're going to get a buildup of metabolites. And then following this, um, then it's going to dilate. Um, a myogenic response is kind of a buffering system. So if there's more stretching of the arteries upstream, um, this will, the vessels will constrict um, to reduce the effect um, of that upstream uh, dilation. Uh, lastly, heat will result in dilation. Um, so on a particularly warm day today, um, your arterioles will be dilating and that kind of helps with heat dissipation. Uh, whereas in the middle of winter, they'll be constricting and that's why you kind of get cold fingers and things like that. Um, adrenaline, this is a particularly important point, I think. Um, adrenaline has varying effects on different receptors. So if it's on an alpha one receptor, um, and we might find this in our skin and our, our digestive system, um, this will result in constriction. Uh, however, if it attaches onto beta two receptors, such as in our heart and our muscle cells, um, this will result in dilation. Um, and, then, and the reason for this is because uh, we don't need too much blood to our digestive system uh, when we're in a fight or flight response. So therefore we restrict the blood flow. Um, however, we do need a lot of blood going to the heart and to the muscle which is why we dilate uh, the arterioles there. Um, capillaries allow for the exchange of nutrients and wastes. Um, and we have four main pressures. Uh, the main thing to take here is that as you go along the length of the capillary from left to right here, um, the capillary hydrostatic pressure will uh, decrease. And that means that we get a shift from filtration or going from the capillary out into the interstitium. Um, and this will eventually reverse and cause the interstitial fluid to go back into the capillary. Um, the excess fluid that isn't reabsorbed will go through our lymphatics. Um, these lymphatics have valves. Um, they drain back into your heart eventually. 
Um, and this is at the venous angle, which we'll come across next year, which is at the junction of the IJV and the subclavian on both sides, left and right. Uh, in terms of blood pressure, um, there's a lot of control around the blood pressure. However, the main thing to know here is that baroreceptors, uh, which are located at the carotid sinus, um, which is along your neck, and the aortic arch, um, these are stretch receptors. So if we have increased pressure, um, this is going to result in more stretch. More stretch means more firing. More firing means that our blood pressure is too high, and therefore we activate the parasympathetic nervous system to reduce the blood pressure. So I've just talked through the vice versa here. Um, and you can read the scenario uh, if we have a reduced blood pressure. Um, in terms of long-term control, we have the, um, the RAS system, which is fairly extensive on the next slide. Um, and we also check our sodium levels. Um, if we have dysfunctional kind of checking of our sodium levels, this will result in high blood pressure. Um, this is the RAS system here. Um, it's quite a lot to take in. Um, I guess the main important thing is for you guys to know uh, would be angiotensin converting enzyme, which you would have done a couple of weeks ago, perhaps. Um, um, and knowing about uh, vasoconstriction and the fact that adrenaline and things like that come from your adrenal glands. Um, but yeah, you can read through this diagram at another time. Have a, for the sake of time and to get to the questions, uh, I'll skip over this. Uh, but you'll keep coming back to this next year um, and you'll slowly become familiar with it. Um, and lastly, with our endothelium, it's simple squamous endothelial cells. That's important to know. Uh, and it has various functions. Uh, the main ones that we want to stop um, is to stop clotting because we don't want to block up our blood vessels um, and to control dilation and constriction to allow for proper blood supply. We have a list of vasodilators and constrictors. Um, they're good to know. Um, and then we get to our practice questions. Um, so I kind of raced through the content a bit there. Um, so if you have any questions before we get to the practice questions, um, this is the time to let me know. Um, otherwise we'll keep moving. Um, and in response to um, actually, no, I'll just reply over the chat. Um, but if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll move on in 30 seconds. Okay, so, um, so we have another question here. So if constricting an arterial means less flow, is it also less pressure? Um, in terms of less pressure, um, there's still pressure trying to push through um, from before the constriction and after the constriction. Um, but essentially the reason for less flow is because we increase the resistance by uh, reducing the radius. Um, so we're not necessarily changing the pressure, we're just changing the resistance against the flow, if that makes sense. Um, so that comes to our one over radius to the power of four. In terms of filtration of the capillaries, um, Filtration of the capillaries, well, if we have, if we have um, arterial constriction, there's less blood um, entering our capillaries. Um, and I believe that would reduce, oh, it would uh, slightly reduce the amount of filtration we have. Um, so what might happen is that we might reduce pressure here at the arterial side. Um, so we'll still have some filtration. It's just that crossing over point uh, may change a tiny bit. 
Um, in terms of the Venus return equation, um, sorry, some of these are private questions. So that's why they're not showing up in your chat. Um, in terms of Venus return, um, a good way to remember this um, is considering where blood will flow. So from the area of higher pressure to lower pressure. Um, so if we think about where our venous blood is trying to eventually return to, this will always be the heart. Um, and where is it returning from? Well, it's returning from our systemic circulation. So that explains the top side of our uh, venous return fraction. Um, and in terms of the denominator, the RVR, um, this one's not too important, but you can picture this as more of a tumor that might be growing in. So if you have a greater resistance, that means you're gonna reduce your venous return here. Um, but in terms of remembering the equation, it's probably not that useful in all, in all honesty. Um, the more important part is knowing that venous return is equal to cardiac output. Um, and with that, we might move on to practice questions. Um, there are about 25 or so. Um, it would be good to get some feedback as we go along. Um, but yeah, we'll make a start on them. Um, so two main factors that determine venous pressure. Um, if you're too scared to send them into the main chat, you can also just send them directly to me. Um, but yeah, this will work best if we get some sort of interaction. Okay, cool. So we're getting a lot of Ds here um, and that's correct. So the two main factors that will determine our venous pressure is how much blood we have and how distensible or how stretchable our walls are. Um, so distensibility is talking about compliance. Um, so if they're easily distensible, um, that means it's a lot easier to stretch them. Um, and volume of blood. If we have more volume, this will increase our pressure. So which of the following would cause the greatest increase in blood flow through a blood vessel? Um, and here we're talking about our resistance is equal to one over radius to the power of something. Good, good, good. Um, oh boy, oh, sorry about that. Um, just noticed my slides aren't that great uh, in terms of these answers. Um, but yes, the correct answer on this slide here is C. Um, have I must have made a change while making these? Um, but yeah, that's good. So the common denominator in both B and C is doubling the diameter, uh, which will ultimately increase it by a lot. Um, sorry about that. Um, it would be C, it would be C here. Um, it's just a mistake on my part. Sorry about that. Um, question three, so this is the question I posed earlier to do with um, what would happen if you had a heart transplant? Um, good, good. So 100 BPM due to an absent parasympathetic innervation. That's perfect. So the reason for that is once you cut the heart out of someone, it sounds a bit gruesome, and transplant it over to the recipient, uh, you won't have that vagus nerve there. So we're having an absent parasympathetic innervation. Someone were to lack an AV node, what might we expect with the EDV and heart rate? So um, I'll explain this one here. Um, so the reasoning for D here is if we were to lack an AV node, uh, we're not getting a delay between right atrial contraction and ventricular contraction, uh, which will ultimately result in less blood um, entering the right ventricle or the left ventricle, either ventricle. Um, and this will result in a decreased, uh, in a decreased end diastolic volume. 
Um, yeah, and then if we were to lack an AV node, we wouldn't change the heart rate uh, because your SA node is the one that is dictating the overall rate of the heart. Um, so that's why we have D, decreased EDV or decreased end diastolic volume um, and no change to heart rate. Yeah, good. So we're getting a lot of Bs here. Um, and that's correct. So contraction won't occur unless we get extracellular um, calcium here. Um, yeah. um, just going back to the previous question for this one here, um, there's just a question with Oh, well, there are a couple of questions. Um, so wouldn't a lack of the AV node lead to conduction by the bundle of Hiss or Purkinje fires? Um, well, even if we lose the AV node, um, if we consider the three locations where we get spontaneous firing, the SA node, AV node, and the Purkinje fires, Purkinje fibers, our SA node is still the fastest. So that will still dictate our overall heart rate since that's going at the fastest rate. Um, for question four, how would the electricity travel from the SA node to the ventricles without the AV node? Um, that is a fantastic question. Um, and that um, I don't have a solid answer for. Sorry about that. Uh, that's probably just me making up a question. Um, in all honesty, it may, it probably would not. And that, yeah. I think that question, Zara, I think that's talking about um, third degree AV block. So you actually get disassociation between the SA node and the ventricles. So that's a good question. Good thinking. In terms of question six, all of the following will increase venous return except Yeah, good. So we're getting a lot of ease here, and that's correct. So if we have increased right atrial pressure, that'll resist the flow uh, for venous return. Um, C is a bit of a odd one here, but remembering our venous return is equal to, to our cardiac output. So as plasma fluid leaves the capillary over its length, over its length, how would this change capillary hydrostatic pressure? Good, good, so getting A's here. So decreased at the distal end. So that's going back to our, um, to our decrease in capillary hydrostatic pressure over the length of our capillary here. Um, so it would decrease at the distal end. Question eight, Isovol isovolumetric contraction occurs during what phase of the electrocardiogram? Good, so we have Bs and that's perfect. So remembering that ventricular contraction occurs during the QRS complex um, and hence it's our R wave here. So during the systolic phase, uh, what proportion of blood goes towards stretching arterial walls and what proportion actually flows through them? Good, so we have a bunch of Es and that's correct. So two thirds goes towards stretching them. Um, and then only one third flows through. Uh, but remembering that this two third that originally goes towards stretching the arterial walls during the cyst during systole uh, will actually be the blood that's flowing through during diastole. Uh, so that's good. Okay, so doing some maths here, what is our pulse pressure for a blood pressure of 135 over 85? And that's good. We've got a couple Bs 
and that's perfect. So remembering that our pulse pressure is systolic minus diastolic. Um, so 135 minus 85 is 50. Yeah. And then leading on from that, uh, what would be our mean arterial pressure? Remembering that there are two equations. Um, one might be slightly easier to use than the other. Good, so we have a bit of a mix, E and Ds. Um, so in this case, it will be our D. Um, so I believe that the, we have two equations, um, but since these numbers aren't that friendly to being divided in three, I would probably favor the diastolic plus one third of our pulse pressure. So remembering that our pulse pressure is 50, um, one third of that is roughly 16 or so. Um, 16 plus 85 is about uh, 101 or so. Um, generally, they'll be a bit nicer than these numbers during the exam. So what would we expect in terms of baroreceptor firing when we immediately get up from bed? Immediately get up from bed. So going from horizontal to vertical. Good, so B, so a reduced rate of firing, and that's perfect. So as we stand up, um, the blood pressure temporarily decreases, which results in less stretching and therefore a reduced rate of firing. Um, and eventually this will cause, um, and this will initiate the response to increase my blood pressure uh, to compensate for me standing up. So in right heart failure, what might we expect here? Um, where would blood be backing up into? Good, so we're getting Cs and that's perfect. So remembering that our right heart um, is on the right side. So this will be receiving blood from the systemic circulation. So if it's, un so if it's able to receive blood, but it's unable to pump it back out, um, that means we're gonna get a backlog into the systemic circulation, um, and therefore we're going to get peripheral edema, which is like when you have some ankle swelling um, and perhaps even going all the way up to the back. Um, pulmonary edema is concerning the left side of the heart, um, where you get left heart failure. Oh, right, forgot about this question. Um, so what would occur with left heart failure? What type of edema? But yeah, so for this one here, it is E. So pulmonary edema, um, if we get left heart failure, it's unable to pump outside out of the left heart and therefore fluid backs up um, to what occurs right before the left side of the heart, which is our lungs. Um, and therefore we get pulmonary edema, which is kind of fluid backing up um, around our lungs. And uh, that's not a good thing. Okay, a bit of a lengthy stem here. So Jordan is having trouble reading the blood pressure monitor and occludes blood supply to his hand. Um, and when it is released, blood surges back in and it feels very warm now. Uh, what has occurred? Good, so we're getting Ds and that's perfect. So the key word in this question here is that we've occluded blood supply. So that means that there's a buildup of metabolites within the hand and probably the forearm. Um, and as a result, when we release the blood pressure cuff, uh, blood will surge back in to clear those metabolites out. Um, in terms of why it isn't E, um, it's just a bit too short of a time frame, um, And we haven't really had any necrosis here, I hope. Um, we haven't killed that person's hand yet. And then I believe this is the last one for our content before we move on to ECGs. Um, and this is a bit of a farm question as well, but um, 
So for antagonizing alpha-1 receptors. Good, good. So we're going, getting a bunch of Bs here, um, which is correct. So, um, so alpha-1, if you activate them, that's going to result in vasoconstriction, right? Um, which is going to increase your blood pressure. Um, however, if you block those alpha-1 receptors, you're going to get hypotension, um, which is why we often use tantalosin uh, for people with BPH and hypertension. So it's like a two-in-one drug, uh, which is pretty great. Um, yeah, so we'll move on to the ECG now. Um, the ECG is a bit rough. Um, it's a lot to take in. Um, but I think really the best way is to take it in a step-by-step -step approach. Um, so looking at your rate, rhythm, cardiac axis, and looking at each segment and each wave um, and each interval uh, of the ECG. So I have about nine ECGs here. Um, and we'll try to go through them and with a bit of explanation on how to approach them. So I'll start off with this one. Um, there are no details here. Um, I'll talk through this one here. Um, so going back to our steps here, um, we want to go through all of these essentially. Um, so name, date, time, technical errors, et cetera. Um, we'll never really have the first two, um, but what we can appreciate here is we can see uh, multiple things. Um, so if we look between two R waves, uh, we can see that there is about, there's nearly eight large boxes, um, which gives us bradycardia. Um, so the heart is going too slow. Um, and the other most prominent thing here is that we can see that there's going to be an AV block. Um, because if we consider the PR interval, so the start of our P wave all the way to our QRS, um, this is uh, more than five small squares. So therefore we have first degree AV block. Um, and first degree AV block is where you have um, just a slower AV node. So it takes longer for an electrical signal to pass from the atrium and into the ventricles. Um, so here, this one is a bit of a buzzword here. Um, so question two, does anyone know what these sawtooth patterns are or what they might indicate? Yeah, perfect. So this is atrial flutter. Um, so this is a good pattern to know. Um, if you ever see these jagged sawtooth-like patterns, um, that is indicative of atrial flutter. Now here, this one's quite an important one to be able to recognize, um, especially in terms of real life consequences. So what do we see and in which leads are they occurring in? And then moving on to think about which artery it might be affecting. Okay, good. So the main thing that we see here is ST elevation. I mean, you can see ST elevation in quite a few leads. Um, so you can see it in lead one here, AVL, V2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 as well. Um, so this is probably indicating a bit of an anterior and probably also lateral um, AMI. Uh, we can also see some ST depression uh, in AVR, um, AVF, and number three, which is, um, this is the, it's kind of like the complementary ST depression to the ST elevation in V2 to 6. Um, yeah, so as, as some people said here, this is probably the left anterior descending or our widow maker. Um, and here's a good diagram that helps us to visualize what lead is looking at what part of the heart here. So V1 and 2 
uh, we're looking quite, um, yeah, V1 to kind of V4, we're looking at the very front of the heart. So that's indicating our uh, left anterior descending. Uh, V5 and 6 are further along the chest, and therefore it's going to be looking at our lateral heart, which is the left circumflex. circumflex. Um, we also have lead one doing that too. Um, and then lead two, AVF and lead, lead two, lead three and AVF are looking at the bottom of the heart, uh, which for the most part is our right, ventri uh, right coronary artery. Um, this is where I wanted to bring in this picture here because I find that this is very, very useful in terms of our STEMIs and our end STEMIs. So this is lining up uh, what lead we're looking at as well as what artery this might affect. So if we were to see, for example, ST elevation in lead one, um, AVL, V5 and V6, that would indicate a lateral AMI, uh, which is probably an occlusion to the left circumflex. Um, so this is a diagram that's pretty good to commit to memory. This one here, it probably even more important to realize if you ever see this. Yeah, perfect. So ventricular fibrillation. Um, you all would have heard the story from Nadita. Um, but yeah, this is a very important thing to pick up um, because you can't have blood that's exiting the heart properly. Um, yeah, so this is a bad situation. This one here also looks a bit messy. Yeah, good. So this one is AFib um, or atrial fibrillation. Um, and we can see that uh, because there's no presence of distinctive P waves. Um, these small things in between are probably probably more T waves, because if you have these large ventricular depolarizations, you have to have a T wave to repolarize it. Um, but yeah, if you ever see it like this, where you can't identify P waves, that's going to be your atrial fibrillation. Um, yeah, so atrial fibrillation is no P waves, whereas atrial flutter from earlier before is that uh, jagged sawtooth pattern. Now here, number six. And this will be our last one before we move on to cardiac output, cardiac axis. Um, sorry about the squares. They're probably quite faint and very difficult to read. Um, but there are two big squares between each R wave. Yeah, good. So for the interest of time, we'll move on. Um, so this is sinus tachycardia. Um, so what we have is it appears fairly normal. We're not getting any massive spikes. There's no ST elevation. Um, we can still see P waves as well, um, although they're probably a bit notched. Um, but we have sinus tachycardia, and this is going at about 150 BPM. Uh, so the way we calculate that is we take 300 and divide it by the number of big squares between adjacent R waves. So 300 divided by two is about 150. And then we have cardiac out, cardiac axis. So I'll walk you guys through the first one here because um, cardiac axis can get fairly confusing. Um, so what I like to do first is I like to look at lead one. So lead one, if we compare this spike here, we can see that it's upwards, um, its upward spike is greater than the downward spike. So therefore lead one is considered positive. Um, and then after looking at lead one, we wanna look at AVF. And once again, we can see that the upwards uh, deflection is greater than any downwards deflection. So therefore AVF is also positive. Um, and, and considering that lead one and AVF is positive, um, we don't have to do any further checks. Um, so this is considered a normal axis. 
So what I did here, um, and I'll try to show this, um, is we checked lead one. So we checked lead one. And essentially, if lead one is positive, that means that this entire area is um, up for grabs. This is what it could be. Then after we checked lead one, we checked AVF. And since AVF was possible, sorry, AVF was positive, that means it can be in this area here. And knowing that, um, if we look at where both of those areas cross over, um, that is between our zero and our positive 90 degrees. So therefore we know it's within our normal axis. So if we go back to, uh, if we go back to, So now we'll do the same for this second cardiac axis question. Um, so I'll give you guys a minute or two um, and chuck it in the chat. Yeah, good. So we're getting a couple of right axis deviations. Um, and yeah, that's good. So what we can see here from lead one is that if we compare the upwards deflection to the downwards, the downwards is greater. Um, so therefore, we know that it's going to be, um, it can't be normal. It's either going to be right or no man's land. Then if we check AVF, AVF is going to be positive because our upwards reflection is greater than our downwards. Um, and therefore, we have right axis deviation here. Um, because our AVF here is positive. Um, and once again, we don't actually need to check lead two, um, but we'll come to this in a couple of questions. Here we have another one. So we're getting a couple left axis deviations. Um, and that's good. So what we will always want to check first is our lead one, looking at our upwards reflection compared to the downwards reflection. We can consider that lead one here is positive. So that's normal. And then if we check AVF, the upwards reflection is smaller than the downwards reflection. And therefore, this is abnormal. And what situation we've ended up here is that we are currently in this top, top right quadrant. And the issue when we narrow it down to the top right quadrant is that we don't know. Um, um, we don't know whether this is either normal or if this is left axis deviation. So what we have to do is we have to check lead two to confirm whether it's normal or if it's left axis deviation. If lead two is positive, it's going to be normal. But if lead two is negative, it's going to be less left axis deviation. So if we take a look at it now, um, looking at lead two, we can, we can look at the upwards reflection versus the downwards reflection. And we can see that the down reflection is greater, which means that our lead two is negative and therefore it's a left axis deviation. And in question 10, this will be our last one before we finish up and then we can go through some other, we can go over the questions again. So we'll go over the right axis deviation one again, once we finish up this one. Yeah, good. So we're getting a couple left axis deviations, um, and that would be correct. So same scenario as last time. We checked the lead one, and the upward reflection is greater. So that means that it's going to be uh, positive, which is perfectly normal. 
And then moving on from that, we check the AVF. And what we can see is that the upwards reflection is smaller than the downwards, and therefore this is going to be negative. Um, and this is abnormal. And we have to differentiate whether it's going to be left axis deviation or whether it's going to be normal. So to do that, we check our lead two. And what we can see here is that our upwards reflection is slightly smaller than our downwards reflection. And therefore it's going to be negative. So if we take a look here, um, um, so what we did first is we checked our lead one and it was positive. So looking at the right kind of semicircle and then we checked our AVF and that limited it down to our top, top right quadrant um, here. And then we checked our lead two um, and that ended up being negative. So it narrowed it down to left axis deviation for that one. Um, so just a few general questions that I'm getting. So should we memorize the cardiac axis circle for the exam? Is there a good way to memorize it? Um, yes, so uh, you should memorize this circle here. Um, I think that's quite valuable. Um, the main things to know, um, know that lead one goes from uh, right to left, AVF goes from top to bottom, and lead two kind of um, goes on this funky angle, uh, kind of from the top right to the bottom left. Um, so I think it's it's good to be able to draw out this um, circle and figure out where it goes. Um, in terms of if there's a good way to memorize it, um, the best way to memorize it is probably practice, I would say, um, and trying to remember which direction your leads go. Um, so lead one is going from right to left. AVF top to bottom, lead two is top right to bottom left. Um, axis deviation is indicating, um, what axis deviation indicates is kind of the general direction in which your heart is contracting. So normally your heart starts off in, your heart contractions go from your right atrium, um, and down into your left ventricle. So that's going from top right to bottom left, uh, which is what this diagram here shows. So we have, um, if I annotate, this is, the, this is the right shoulder. This is the kind of right shoulder of someone. And this is the left shoulder. So it's going from the top right of their body to the bottom left of their body. Um, so if it goes in an opposite direction, um, that could indicate that you might have a stronger right side of the heart or your left side left side of the heart might be dying. Um, and same thing for a left axis deviation. If it's left axis deviation, that could indicate that your left side of the heart is too strong, so hypertrophy, or your right heart is kind of failing. Um, so therefore your overall electrical direction um, is going a bit off. Um, no, so I have another question here that's asking, will we have to explain the causes for deviation? Um, and the answer for that is no, you shouldn't need to. Um, the main things I guess you should take is that uh, left axis deviation could be left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, so there's a lot of muscles, so therefore the main overall direction of electrical flow is towards the left side or for right uh, axis deviation, your right heart is getting too big. Um, and this results in the overall direction of electrical flow to go towards the right side of the body. Um, that's the main thing, but you won't really need to explain the causes for deviation. Um, the most likely question you'll get for ECG is an EMQ. They'll give you a list of conditions that it could be, and they'll ask you to interpret the ECG and select which one it is. Um, we will go through over right axis deviation. Um, just to answer some questions. Um, okay, so for this one here. Um, so what I'll do is I will hit two questions at one time. Um, and I'll try to explain 
how we kind of interpret our cardiac axis circle, um, as well as reading this ECG. So um, if I draw a circle here, um, if we have a circle and we split it into lead one, AVF, that's a bit funky, and then should be about lead two like that. So AVF, uh, lead two and lead one. So when we interpret our ECGs, we look at lead one first. And when we look at lead one, uh, we can see that this upwards reflection here is quite small. And if we compare that to a downwards reflection, the downwards reflection is quite large, uh, which means that overall, this is negative because going down is negative. So, we, so knowing that lead one is negative, um, that means that if we consider lead one going from this side here to this side here, um, lead one being negative means that it has to be in this area. And then after that, we look at our, um, we look at our AVF. So once again, if we look at our AVF, we look at the upwards reflection and that's quite large, but then we look at this downwards reflection and it's quite small. So comparing those two um, is going to be positive because going up is positive. And overall for that, that means that our AVF has to be positive, which means it has to be in this lower semicircle. And hopefully it should make the colors darker as I do this. Yeah, good. So right now we've kind of compared, um, uh, we've compared what results we see in lead one, which is this left semicircle versus AVF, which is this bottom semicircle. And now we can see that the overlapping area is in this, um, it is in this, it is in this area here. And therefore it is our right axis deviation. Um, hopefully that helps a little bit. Please let me know. Yeah, perfect. Um, good, otherwise um, that basically concludes everything. Um, so that will conclude the lecture. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me or just message me on Facebook um, and I'll try to help you guys out. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, otherwise that is all.